And it's the Emissary Authors Podcast, once again, where we help faith-driven founders, CEOs, and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. My name is Paul Edwards, and I'm glad to be back on another episode with my partner in crime and my co-host, Jason Todd. Jason, great to have you with us. How are you? Always a pleasure. Look forward to this uh, podcast as well with our author, Larry Cripps. As we're recording this, we've got a cool event that's coming up as part of his book launch. It's also a fundraiser getting a lot of success off of that. And I was excited to play a, uh, play a part in this book because, you know, he has such a compelling story over so many years. Yep. And like many of our authors needed to encapsulate that into a book so that it lives on after the fact. So I'm excited to bring Larry onto the show. Larry, welcome to the Emissary Authors Podcast. Well, good afternoon. It's good to be here. Great to have you back. Great to have you on the show, my friend, and and so proud of you and everything that you've uh, worked through to get to this point. We're recording at the time we're recording this. This is two weeks from uh, your official launch uh, fundraiser event there in uh, Nashville, and uh, shoot, I just realized Memorial Day weekend will hit even before that. So, you know, we're uh, we're, we're down to ten days here before your book is live, and away it goes, and we'll see where it takes you, but. Uh, Great to have you with us and uh, eager to dig in on, uh, to let our audience hear the background of how this came to be. And so that's where I want to start. And just to say, you know, you, you reach this point in your life, you've got all this experience and all these stories to relate. Uh, why this book and why now? Let's start there. Well, yeah, you know, I, you know, I'd always talk about writing a book, but it's, you know, it's either easier said than done and, and. You know, several years ago, I'd been teaching a class at our local church for about five or six years. And I felt like I was preaching to the choir and with everything that's going on in the world, you know, I just, I just felt like I needed to re-engage people that didn't always hear the gospel, you know, and, mm -hmm. and my wife, Charlene convinced me that I had had a lot of experience and it would be foolish to take that, what I had learned, the lessons I had learned from all that experience, you know, to the grave that I need to share with my children first and foremost in our grandchildren, but that there was an audience out there, audience of, you know, young people, veterans and their families, uh, people who know veterans and, uh, try to get their heads around, you know, why their, you know, situations that they face is so unique and, um, uh, and, and, and why it's important that we increase public awareness of some of the challenges that they face. And, and that's what we're doing this, this is book book is one way to do that. You know, I, I thought about this five years ago when I was praying about this, that I, I, you know, about how to engage to, to, to get back out into the, to the, uh, you know, to the flow of things and, and to engage people and, and he impressed me to write a book. And I said, is there anything else I could, you know, besides that? And like I said, it is, you know, I, I knew it would take a lot of time and a lot of effort. I wasn't sure what the message would be. You know, I, I struggled with that. So it took, even after I knew I was going to do it, even as I was, you know, like Moses standing at the burning bush, I had 101 reasons for not writing a book, you know, I said, right. express that to you, wind other book, you know, I'm, I'm, I enjoy books. I do a lot of reading. You know, but there's a lot of information out there and, and what did I have to say that would be different, but, you know, I just started, you know, after about two years, Charlene said, you really need to start on this book. You know, and I had shared with my class that the Lord had impressed me that to write a book. And, uh, I did that actually to hold me accountable. I mean, she, the Lord tells you something, you know, you tell somebody else so that you're accountable you know, to that, while you're trying to figure out just exactly how you're going to do that. And that's where yeah. something started. It, it started based on a need, a, you know, a desire to connect with people. And I knew that a book is a good bridge in doing that. You know, people love to read. That's why there are so many books and, uh, and everybody has a story. You know, I, I wasn't sure how my story would resonate with people, but it, I, but I had a desire and, 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 and love literature, you know, and, and just wanted to see if I could write something that would resonate with people, you know, that, mm. that would not necessarily be focused on me, but would be 
message driven. And, and, you know, so I, I, you know, like I said, I worked with that for about three years and, and, it, and looked at what I had done, my manuscript, but it was not, it was not, it didn't have the message that I wanted. And that's when I, I reached out to the two of you. And, and after about the third interview, you helped me see what that message, you know, that what the message was and, and, uh, and also, you know, the, how we should frame that with the cover of the book, the title of the book. And I knew that exactly. That's exactly what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And then came back and took that huge manuscript and then condensed that down. And you and I worked together, you know, to produce the final product that we're about to release. And I'm excited mm-hmm. about this. It's exactly what I wanted to do. And it, but it, you know, it just takes, you know, God connects us with people that helps us to figure these things out, you know, and he, so he can move us in the direction he wants, he wants us to go. You know? So we're on the verge of doing that. We're here we are you know? and I'm excited. About yeah. it. I feel a great sense of satisfaction knowing that I, I did the impossible and did exactly in my heart what I wanted to do. Yeah. With yeah. I, I remember those first couple of meetings when you had such a significant body of work that because you've been through so many experiences and you have a lot to say to, to say about it. I mean, you've been a chaplain for many years and, and so you've had the opportunity to speak into other people's lives and, and, and I, and I recall with this massive body of work, it, there really kind of was the question, okay, what's the thread? How do we, how do we pull on the thing that really matters? And then that, that became the title, the hope of war, Yeah, which I mm-hmm. think spoke to you. And then that reached, that kind of helped shape the, all of this body of work, what stays, what doesn't, and then, and, and brought us all to a point. That, that, that's exactly true. That's exactly how it happened. You know, I, I couldn't have written, you know, what, what we have produced had I not had this, this large manuscript where I'd done all this research. So when I went back after I had, you know, decided what the matches was going to be as we we agreed upon that and, uh, and you helped me to stay focused on that. Cause you know, again, preachers are long winded, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we, I had some long chapter and, uh, I mean, you know, the, I think chapter 11 was 30 pages long, you know, <laughs> but, but you know, it's, it, but if you're going to tell a story, it's, it's more than information, it's emotion, you know, it's raw experiences, what it's lessons learned, you know, it has, you know, redemptive value, you know, you want to leave some redemptive value in that something people can latch on to who, who perhaps, you know, are working through young people, for example, who are yet to discover, you know, what life is all about and the challenges that they're, they're going to face and to have the tools to know how to challenge those, you know, you know to, to, to face those, you know, I, I was fortunate. I had great mentors, but not everybody has mentors, you know? They, they do they great mentors and, uh, and I was fortunate to have, you know, to be surrounded by a family and great leaders and great men and women who really, uh, you know, didn't tell me how to live my life, but certainly gave me some, some, you know, wise insights, how to approach it. You know, you know people today. A lot of people don't have that. A lot of young people don't have that. This book is a way to give that to them. Mm. You know, that's why we, you know, we, uh, we mentioned the principles there, you know, people who reviewed, reviewed the book, you know, kind of, they will refer to the fact that there, you know, there are great insights that people can really build on. That was the purpose of all those things. And that, that was really the Holy spirit driven. There's no, you know, I, I've always said that between the three of us and, and the Holy spirit, you know, we we've got a foundation. I think we, we offer a foundation to people that they can take and build on, you know, and that's what we want to think they in developing their own story. Yeah. One of the things you bring out in the book is not just this idea of war and the times that you spent in Vietnam and other, fo- and other places, but you talk about where you were born, grew up yeah. and how, uh, you know, you're, you're just a young man from nowhere, USA to now an influential character, why walk us through, why is it, why is that idea of that root 
and where you started so important for you to express as part of your, no, part they, of your because story. you can't get away from from the people that help shape who you are you know I, no. I mean they need some recognition and that first chapter was a chance to give them the recognition that they deserve you know i mean it's like john maxwell spelled no, says no one gets to where they're going on, on their own, you know, that there are people who are involved in that process, you know, that, that help you along the way. And we shouldn't forget that. I mean, we, we, we should reciprocate. And that was my way of doing that. I, it's, I can't get away from, from how I was raised. And the things that I talked about in, in that first chapter were very much a part of my upbringing and they, they, they helped instill the values, you know, that were very important to me. Okay. That kept me grounded. You know, when you're going through a very difficult time, you know, it's those deep convictions, you know, that, that, that are born out of those experiences that are born out of the relationships that you have, you know, that really help that keep you grounded, you know, keep you from quitting, you know, and keep pushing you forward. But, you know, People had a lot of expectations of me, you know, because they had invested a lot in me, you know, and, and so that was one of the things that, that what I experienced failure that, you know, I just pick, pick myself up and continued on just like I always have, because that was the example that I had. Okay. Mm. Well, you know, if we read the script, when we read the scripture, <laughs> that's what we see time and again, you know. A lot of people, you know, who struggle, but you, who, who don't give up, just yeah. keep pushing forward, you know, not a perfect world, not a perfect life, you know, uh, but it's a great life you know, that I, I had, uh, when I thought about, uh, I told Charlene, uh, when we were talking about, you know, getting started and, uh, and why she was so, uh, instrumental and to me actually doing that, you know, step it off and get then start, you know, start writing, uh, was, was the fact that, that, that again, there were just so much, so much, so much, uh, I didn't want I didn't think I could relive all that. All of it was good. It was a great lie, but you know, for example, I got to uh, one part in the book and I, it was about three or four weeks before, uh, I mean, I stopped for a while because I had to mostly a process some of those experiences and, and decide how I was going to talk about them. Mm. And it didn't mean that life wasn't good. It just means that sometimes it's so challenging. You don't want to look back and relive those experiences. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, you, you've moved beyond them, but yet, you know, there's some value in going back and reprocessing those things and and, and thinking it through and letting God lead you through that. And then you begin to see how he was teaching you, you know, during that process so that, you know, you could be of some benefit to others, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, when, uh, you know, uh, it's just, it's just like the Holy spirit comes alongside when we fall on our face, you know? and helps us out and, and that's what we do with other people. You know, we, we process these things, learn things so that we can come alongside when they fall on their face and say, look, it's not, a, it's not so bad, you know, just, just get up, let's just keep moving forward. And, uh, and you'll find in doing that, that, uh, you know, you can get beyond it in times. Mm. As a chaplain and a leader, I, I can only imagine that it's true that as you speak to other people and they have given you influence into their lives and they want to hear from you that as you speak it has the whatever you speak has to make its way through you first you know if you if you speak conviction to someone you feel convicted right if you if you try to raise somebody up you feel your own self like i need to raise myself up too as you open some of these old stories these old chapters of your life that have been perhaps closed for many times for many years how have you seen this process of writing change you from before you took on this task to now that the book has been written and now distilled and is, is, is out in the universe? Well, it did change me. 
you know, all the assumptions that I had that I tried to avoid, uh, were not valid. You know, but again, there was something to learn by going back and reliving those things and, and, and thinking them through. Okay. And trying to pick up the lessons, you know, uh, and even if I had to stop for a while, you know, and give that some room, some latitude to do that, you know, the, the benefits of doing that were evident in the end, you know, I mean, you produced a chapter that has some meaning. It's just not a story. Again, it's a, it's a narrative filled with emotions. It's a narrative filled with, you know, actual experience, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and you find some resolution in the end, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, you know, the worst thing you can do is, is, uh, leave people, you know, wondering, you know, well, well how did it work out? You know, I mean, th th there are some books that end that way, you know, uh, but so we, so I try to, you know, for, for each stage that we were trying to, that I was talking about in each chapter, which really was a stage, it, it was, uh, you know, I moving from one, you know, from being drafted, you know, to becoming a, a soldier and going through the crucible of that change, you know, then going to Vietnam, you know, there are these different phases, you know, uh, that I, that I went through, uh, you know, I just, it was a building, you know, it was a building block process. And I, and I tried to, you know, at the end of those chapters, uh, to explain, you know, the benefit that was derived from by going through that. Yeah. Right? And not to leave that hanging, you know, like I said, I've read so many books sometimes when I'm left, you know, with question marks still, you know, what was the outcome? And, you know, I, you know, I didn't find a conclusion there in that, you know, and I was, it was, I was just left on the edge of the cliff, you know, but, but I'm not that polished of a writer. I mean, I'm just saying for me that that was something I felt like needed to be done, you know? And so I worked on that. It just took me longer, probably it did someone who was very skilled at writing, you know, uh, but I, but I, I, I feel more than, I mean, I, I see these things, you know, I can, as I, as I draft an outline, you know, I can, I can see in my mind how this is going to vote, you know, it's just trying, finding out how to get there, you know, yeah. and being true to the store. In other words, not fabricating anything. I mean, this is. This is what I remember from that experience, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and re being truthful about it, uh, not exaggerating things, but, uh, uh, so is it really important, you know, to, uh, make sure the information was, was really reflect, reflected what actually happened, you know? I think, uh, one of the things that stood out to me the most, Larry, as we were putting all this together was, um, you had all these stories and you knew the, you and possessed the conviction that, um, they would amount to something to the reader and the hardest, the, the, the difficulty that you ran into was figuring out how to put that all together in a, in a book that somebody could read and, you know, and follow the narrative. Yeah. But once we, once we saw once we could begin to see in each chapter, the benefit that a reader could take out of it, even if they're a young person today, who's not heard much about Vietnam, isn't familiar with the conflict, doesn't understand how it came to be, but they can go in there and they can, they can read about stuff that they can, that's public knowledge, right? That's, you know, uh, that you can read research on the internet Yeah, absolutely. from the perspective of someone who lived through it. And at the same time, they can see, they can they can read about a circumstance and say, oh, so there's a different way to do this. There's a different way to think about this. I don't need to just continue going down the same path I've been going because I, I don't have any other way to think about it. And I, I, I always block back to the whole. Well, first, the first chapter. The first I, chapter you... I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you, but, but, but. I wanted to encourage him to think critically. And, and so, you know, by speaking from my own experience, where again, there were a lot of voices that, that were competing for my attention, you know, mm -hmm. and I was too immature to sort all of that out, but the, 
but the advantage that I had, like I said, I had, I had the example of other people, good mentors, you know, who again, never tried to, uh, dominate my life because they wouldn't have worked anyway. You know, I mean, as a teenager, you know, you, you don't want to be pushed faster than the trains would it willing to go. And, sure. and uh, so people were uh, wise in that regard, but it, it's, they live what they, uh, their values and it, my relationship with Larry West, I talked so much about, you know, he was never preaching to me, but he just lived those values. And those values, just like Jason was talking about, were convicting to me. Mm. You know? And and I was inquisitive because I, I saw how his life or an impact he had on people. I never forgot that. I never I talked to one of his door gunners who was one of the reviewers and uh, who who told me that he was different than the other officers that he flew with. And this, mm. this guy had served in Vietnam twice as a door gunner, preaching door gunner. And he, he said, he always reached out to us. He's always interested in the crew, genuine, genuinely interested in people. Well, that was the, the impact it had on me. You know, I, I didn't care about people's background and I, I'm very grateful that I learned that early. Okay. Mm. I didn't care if they were religious or not. I didn't care if they shared my values or not, you know? Uh, we were in, we were in the spot together and I had to depend on them. You know, I, yeah. I, I underscore the fact that we didn't always get along. You know, it was, you know, we were people from a cross section of America and, you know, we were, were, were all kinds of backgrounds and genders and, and ethnic groups. And, and, and so we brought all that to the, you know, to what we were doing, but when it came down to basic combat. You know, you couldn't have a greater group of people because we were committed to each other. We knew that was the only way to survive. You can't walk away, you know, life is like that. You don't have to be in combat to realize how much you need other people. Okay. Yeah. And that, you know, these preconceived barriers that we put up that, that keep us separated, you know, we can, uh, be able to people. We can be friendly to people. You know, we can make those decisions. And I made the decision early based on, again, my parents, based on my, my upbringing in my hometown, based on people I've been, been raised around, you know, based on what I saw in Lynn, you know, I made a choice. I made a choice to treat people like I wouldn't be treated, you know, yeah. and it didn't mean that they had to like me in the process, but you know why? It's just, I went. Like I said, I went to this reunion with these, with the Navy CBs that I was with there at Desert Shield, Desert Storm. I hadn't seen them in 33 years, you know, and they, before I go up there, they, they sent me, you know, an email telling me, say, look, we're so excited about your coming. You know, that, that to the most of us, you're a hero. Well, that just, you know, I'm dumbfounded by that. You know I mean? I've, no. I've never, but that's how they treated me. Always treated me that way. To be able to speak to them, to tell them, you know, because that my introduction to, again, to becoming a combat chaplain, you know, so I'd had all the experiences that, you know, as a, as a warrior myself that I carried over, obviously in what I did, but to be able to apply that, you know, in my own right, you know, my concept of what a combat chaplain should be, it's like the door gooder friend that played with Lynn West told me that. He said, I wish you'd been my chaplain in Vietnam. After I read your book, I wish you'd been my chaplain in Vietnam. He said, I never oh. saw my chaplain. And I said, well, I, I'll tell you, my, 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 uh, my concept of combat chaplain was forged about the, the th last four months of my tour of Vietnam when I had this rolling holy Southern Baptist chaplain came out and he was always out in the thick. Thick of it, yeah, you know, with us. That was the only chaplain I saw the whole time I was in Vietnam. And Chaplain Riley was always out there with us. And I said to myself, "Is I was if I were if I were ever a chaplain, that's exactly how I would do. I would be in the thick of it with the people I was trying to minister to, whether whether they responded to my ministry or not. I would share their hardships, you know, yeah. just like Moses. You know, he he he'd rather you know share the hardships of his own people than he would to live in the palace." 
and that is the really a, a good definition for a combat chaplain. You got to be out there with it. Yeah. Here, as a shield, as a storm, where well, they remember the fact, everywhere they turned around, I was always there. I mean, I lost, I was lost there, you know, in the desert. And yeah. Because I just stayed on the go, you know, and, and, and of course, I didn't carry a weapon. And I had one RP, which I left in the rear with the gear to keep things going. Like if people need to contact me or whatever. So I would, I would have other people who would volunteer to ride with me until they, they were exposed to all the danger. And I said, Jeff, we're not going with you again. I've never slept all night in my mob gear. You know what I'm saying? My civil protection gear. It's stuff like that. Yeah. I learned that from Chaplain Riley, but I, but I had a chance to flesh it out in my own right, you know, during Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And that's what I meant. That's what I told him is that, you know, you really shaped me into the person that I became. Mm, yeah. And that was the person I really wanted to be, but I had a chance to flesh that out, to experience it, to really, uh, to see how it would work because that was my concept of what I should be doing. I, I should be, you know, sharing the hardships that you were sharing, you know, yeah. and exposing myself to the things you were being exposed to and preaching the gospel and living the gospel and being there, you know, uh, is a symbol of a, the presence of God among all that chaos. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I think it's John Maxwell who talks about this idea that the, the old saying that, uh, uh, experience is the best teacher is a bit incomplete because there's lots of people with a lot of experiences who haven't learned anything. And he, he completes that statement by saying it's evaluated experience which perhaps is the best teacher. And I, I see that in your book that you're in thinking through your experiences, you're evaluating them, and then you're concentrating them into a message for the reader. And I'm, and I'm wondering for the younger folks in the military, perhaps who are either in the thick of it or getting out of the military, transitioning into, you know, private life, what's the, what are some of the messages that you bring out in your book that you would want to leave with them? Well, I mean, the, what they do and how they train to do what they do can really be, uh, addictive. And you, you think that that's, that's what it's all about. It's about being, being thought of as a hero when, when, you know, uh, you're not really being tested whether or not you're a hero, you know what I'm saying? I mean. Heroes are born out, out of a, out of a moment, you know, that require some type of response. You know, you, we don't know exactly how, you know, every time you go through training, I can remember thinking that when I went to Vietnam, I was very honest about that, whether or not I would stand the test, you know, mm. and, but the purpose of the crystals I had gone through was to get me closer, you know, to, to whether, you know, to that actual experience, you know, and, and so you have to be patient with yourself and there's always those self doubts, but even, but once you go through it, then, then the other problem is the other side of the coin is, is that you feel very self-assured. Okay. Yeah. And, and you're addicted and I talked about being addicted to the adrenaline rush, you know, like the last mission I went on, I didn't have to go on that mission. There are other people who volunteer wanting to go, but I was so addicted in my own, you know, my own mind, uh, that nothing could happen to me because I'd already gone through it. And, you know, and I, you know, I could, uh, you know, I was 10 feet taller and our fruit, well, fruit, but it's not true. You know, when you, the problem with that mindset is the fact that you don't realize that anything can happen. And life can change in a, on a dime. And, but the, to, get, to get back to the question, again, I want to be transparent in this book to help people think that they, there's always the danger there of getting sucked into that mindset. And, and warriors do, they really get addicted to, uh, to what they do. They, they love it. Okay. But what's really important though is are the relationships that you build. It's like trying to save the world, like Navy SEALs, you know, do. Okay. That you talk to them, they're out there to save the world, you know, to save America, to preserve freedom, to protect our way of life. 
but yet, you know, their divorce rate is ninety percent. So you can you can win the world and lose what's most important to you, and that's your family. So you you need this balance. Yeah. Okay? And so I talk about these things to help warriors understand there has to be a balance. What they do is extremely important. We can't do without them. It costs us a lot to protect the nation. Okay. And that's exactly what they're doing. All right. And everything that we hold dear, they're sacrificing to protect. And they feel that dedication and commitment to do it. And they train very hard to do it. Not everyone, but for the most part. Okay. But the thing is, at the same time, you got to realize that relationships are important. Your family is important. Your children are important. You know, you, you, you got to find a way to strike a balance and you can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can do it with God's help. You can do it with a supportive family by not taking them for granted. You could do it by remembering the small things you need to do, like making an effort, you know, even when you're under pressure to do something special for your wife, like bring her flowers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we get lost in our own self-importance importance in what we do because we, we know that defending a nation requires a lot of us, but we can't do it at the expense of the other things that are more important, that are more enduring, like our relationship. And I try to, I try to stress that Paul did very, a great job at helping me do that. Okay. And, but those, those were the things I wanted to bring out. Okay. I, I, I wanted to see this individual who was from the start, you know, to the end, who, you know, was. You know, small town, nowhere, you know, but yet the values that he took with him, played forward, you know, made all the difference in the world. And it well, gave for, him, for our viewers and listeners, I want to emphasize that you, what you're talking about there, this value of relationships and how you call it out in your book, you've lived this because in, as part of this whole launch process for you. You know, many times people in their older age have a smaller circle yeah. and your circle is vast and people seem to love you and respect you and are coming out of the woodwork to support you. And that's unique. And, I, and not everybody is successful in, in creating that type of environment for themselves and the people that are around them. And it seems to be natural to you. Well, those are, that's the family I came from. You know, they invested in us and other people. I, I mean, it was just not their own concerns and their own ambitions that they worked for. You know, uh, dead of all, my father, uh, I probably, you know, people, you know, my mother was reckless and outgoing. You know, I don't think she was afraid of anything. My father was more methodical, more, more thoughtful and more nurturing, you know, so I kind of got the best of both worlds, you know what I'm saying? But, but when people, you know, even after all this time, still remember them, yeah. you know, it's fixed to what you're talking about, you know what I'm saying? And so I feel so fortunate that one of the greatest gifts that, that, that they gave me was, was to see this, that life is, a you know, is, um, there's more to life than yourself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's, it's about people, you know, it, it's about always being a, available and be a, being approachable, you know, and you're not there to solve their problem. I mean, people need to solve their own problem. That's the only reason that's the only way they can grow, you know, but they, but they do need someone who will listen, you know, they need a sounding board and uh, you're right. I had thought about this when, you know, you sent me the, uh, sent me the numbers of pre-sold books, you know, I, 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 I was really blown away by that because I thought at this age, a lot of people I know are gone, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, you know, we have a whole generation of growing up. They don't know Larry Cripps. You know? Yep. <laughs> so, yep. Is, and so I feel very, very fortunate that people still care, but, I, but, but. I try to remember people, the little thing, people's birthdays, you know, uh, 
their milestones and send them a note and say congratulations. You know, uh, I think one of the reasons why the, the CBs responded the way they did is because I stayed in contact with them. Even though I didn't come to the reunion on Facebook, I, I had a connection and I, and their children, you know, the milestones that they reached, you know, I think of my own children and I like people to recognize the milestones that they reach. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, Larry, it, um, it's, it's again, and, and I, Oh, I, the, the thing that, um, that's standing out to me as you talk about this is, uh, the point you made in the book where you said, um, you know, uh, uh, soldiers and, and warriors tend to, tend to think that, uh, putting on that uniform, um, somehow makes you superhuman yeah. though you have transcended your own limitations yeah. and that's as you discovered especially after 9-11 uh, working at the pentagon wasn't true and in fact it took you on this journey of um, digging into a wound that had been on the inside for you for 30 years at that point but because you had spent an equal amount of time building all those relationships and investing yourself in others. Uh, it didn't take very long for you to find your way out of that. Was it easy? No. Was it painful? Yes. But you had, you had people you could go to who could talk you off the ledge and talk you through to the other side where all of a sudden your career in the last 10 years took on some of its most significant and meaningful work. Um, and that just, you know, that just speaks to. Well, I, I love the, I love to wear the uniform, you know, and, and the way that you wear it, you know, impresses people, you know, mm -hmm. you, you give them attention to detail and, you know, and I have been a blessed, you know, with wars and things because I've been, a, I've been exposed to a lot of things, you know, that generate those. It's, it's not that I was a hero. I thought I was in fact, in fact I cringe at that with people. You know, uh, you know, use that word in reference to me, you know, because I just don't see myself that way, but, but I do see myself as patriotic. I, I see myself as carry on the legacy that was given to me, protecting yeah. that legacy, you know, and honoring those people who sacrificed so much to ensure that I had an opportunity to do the things that I did. I didn't get anywhere that I, I have been without the help of other people. Okay. Hey. And networking, not to, I, I'll be honest with you. When I was a senior lieutenant in my second assignment at the Naval Air Station in Memphis, and, and there were seven chaplains in that department because it was a training command, very large. We had 25, you know, component commands on that base, on that air station. But yet, you know, I knew the system. I could work the system. I, you know, that was one thing I did well. You know, mm -hmm. I, I could make it respond in a way that I wanted to, you know, I, I could call the detailer and negotiate the assignment that I wanted and find the Lord. I I, pr I preached a sermon in chapel about trusting God and find what after it was over, Jason, the, the, I was convicted and the Lord said to me, says, are, are you, are you going to trust, you know, your career to me? Are you going to, are you going to manage it? I mean, which is it? I mean, are, are you going to practice what you preach? You just preached in this congregation or are you going to live the rest of your life manipulating the system to get what you want, making the system a servant to you, boy. And I was really convicted and, but it was freedom. Mm. It, I, I repented of that and I, and I knew, uh, as the Lord is, is, you know, you're being convicted by the Holy Spirit about these things. You know, exactly what your response has to be. There's no other way to respond, but in humility and on your knees and say, God, forgive me for being, you know, for being such a hypocrite. When you talk about the faith of Abraham, and yet I'm not willing to trust you with my career, my future. Yep. And so I, from that point on, I never negotiated my assignment. Mm. From that, that point on, it wasn't all about me. Okay. And, you know. It wasn't always about, you know, talking right, walking straight, wearing the uniform better than everybody else. You know, 
It was about living the life. Yeah. That point out. Yeah. And once I, I decided to do that, everything changed. As there are times I got sorry assignments. And what I did was take was what was given to me and try to make it better. You know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and one example of that, there are Memphis, they, the women were really being marginalized. All these, you know, students that had wives there, there was nothing. We were doing nothing for them. And I started a women's ministry that lasted for 25 years, long after I was gone. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but that, that great because I just opened my eyes and I didn't care about who got the credit. I just focused on what needed to be done. And yes. that's the way I did my ministry from that point on. You know, I've, I've talked about people who want to, you know, who want to transform the chaplain corps because it's like any corporation, you know, it's, it's has its problems and it's corrupt and it's abusive at times. And, and there, there could be a lot of jealousy that people would want me to get involved in that. I said, I'm not interested, you know, I'm only interested in this assignment and this world right here. I mean, the, I said the chapel core is, doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God, you know, mm. and this command I'm in right now belongs to him. This is not my command. This is his command. And my job is to make the, to help the CEO carry the shoulder, this burden of command. And the best way I can do that is to minister to him and to a whole and to their people. Yes. And, and, and live what I preach. And like I said, that was freedom for me. And that's why, you know, I probably lasted so long, but it mm-hmm. wasn't easy. I mean, I, again, there are people get envious of your success. You know, people get jealous you know, of the attention you get. Sometimes you get, you know, in the crosshairs of your command chaplain because the commander favors you over someone else. It's you live in that tension, yeah. but if you, if you don't worry about that, if you trust God with that and just do what's right, you know, and serve others and don't worry about the credit, uh, to me, uh, that's what made my career such an enjoyable period of time. But it, it well, will full of conflict and struggle and, and all kinds of stuff, you know, they go along with the career like that. Uh, but for my, my viewpoint, it was a great lie. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm super proud to be part of taking the, the, the almost 700 pages that you had written and you've lived a lot, many, a lot more pages than that. And then bringing that down to this point of where it's now a book, the hope of war, because I think there's a tremendous amount of value in that and, uh, the message specifically. And there's another message in there that I just heard, and we don't have time to dig into it, but you talked about conviction and you said that the response to conviction is repentance. And what I heard in that is that there's always a clarity that comes in conviction. If some people, some people like wonder, am I feeling convicted? You're never confused. If it's conviction, you know, the response, otherwise it's not conviction. They're well, conflict and not convicted. Yeah. Like I said, it was like Moses at the burning bush. Even when he was, he was offering excuses, he knew what the outcome would be. I mean, even when you're saying no, you know, you know, you're going, you, that obedience is the only, only place to be, you know, that life cannot be satisfying. And that's what I'm saying. You know, I'm really at a point where I'm really satisfied with this book. It's not a, is it a perfect book? It's just a book. Okay. But, but it, it's, it's, I think the book is designed and based on the reviews, I'm just going off the reviews. Okay. And I, and I had people read it that I knew that would be the most critical of all people who, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to expose myself, you know, to the people who would be the most critical in their evaluation. And Terry Edinger was one of them. Okay. And, and he called me, he says, he said, I'm going to tell you, I'm totally surprised about this book. I didn't expect this book to be this good, but he said this, I'm I'm just, I'm paraphrasing what he says, but he's, he's, he said, look, 
this is a great book. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I mentored him for the time he was at Lieutenant JG in 02. And I mentored him to make flag. All right. And, 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 and told him, I said, uh, the lion people, the people you're going to work for are going to love you. The chaplain corps is going to hate you. And you're going to encounter all kinds of jealousy and back body and all kinds of things. Don't pay any attention to that. You know, focus on these people and help them shoulder their responsibility. That's what we've been talking about. Okay. And I said, you one day, because once you get to the flag level, it's, it's all on who's on your board and who knows yeah. you. That's all. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, I may, I may, I, you know, they have said, they're not, they're, all the boards are confidential. Nobody's supposed to talk about it. You take an oath, you know, of confidentiality. And of all things, after my flag board, the recorder calls me. He says, I was, I was a recorder on your board. I said, well, okay, well, congratulations, you know. He said, well, I want to tell you what I said, don't tell me. I don't, I don't, I don't want to know. I don't care what happened, you know. He said, I just want to tell you, you were selected for a flag, but the, but the, the chief of chaplains, uh, wanted someone else. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so that's why you were selected. I said, well, you know why if things really work out because had I been selected, it would have taken me out of the fight. Yeah. All right? And I'd rather be in the fight because I can have more impact where I am as an 06 right now. I tell you, a captain, an 06 in the Navy, boy, you can get away with a lot. I'm, I'm telling you, but there's so much prep work that has to be done. Once you met flag, you just can't yeah. bounce into a room, you know, unannounced. You can't do stuff like that. Oh, six, you know, it's just, a, I yeah. love it. it. I just, it was, a, it just opened doors, you know, where I could do exactly what I wanted to do. And that's just reach people. Yeah. I just wanted to, to be there for them and, and to show them I could out, outrun them. You know, I could, I could hang in there with it, with the best of them that I had, I could bring something to the table because I had the experience, you know what I'm saying? It was born out of experience. It, it was not born out of a vacuum. It wasn't my opinion. You know, it's just like Jim McGarris said, you know, uh, he listened. Well, those old six colonels in the Marine Corps listened as well. Yeah. Why? Because again, it was not history. You know, it was, it was, I actually lived it. And I couldn't argue with that. Yeah. You know? And I could stand toe to toe and disagree with them and tell them what they didn't want to hear. And with the Navy SEALs, you know, they got me in a lot of trouble because they don't, they're not used to people telling them no, you know? No. And, uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's been a, it's Jason, it's been a great, great life. And, and, uh, I'm grateful to both of you, you know, you know, I've told you many times, you know, how I feel about this. I mean, you know, us working together, really the Holy Spirit has really helped brought, you know, combined our talents and our gifts. I think it's going to be a good tool, you know, this book is going to be good too. The early response indicate that, that you know, I, I told, uh, Charlie and I talked about the early response and I said, you know, any, and we both agree. We said, whatever you lay at God's feet, you know, I say it in the book, when you lay it at God's feet, he'll use it. Yeah. And that, that, that was the turning point for me was I wanted to hold on to the fact and, and believe that I was above the fray and I had been running fast and running hard and the, and the Lord had to show me that I was no different. If I would be that vulnerable, then he could use that. If I could be that transparent, he could use that because that's what most warriors struggle with. Yeah. You know, is thinking that you're different from everybody else, but you're not, you're not different. Yeah. You know, your, your vanity is there. You know, you, if you overlook your humanity and think you're some Superman, you're in trouble. You know? Yep. Yeah. And God wants to use you. God wants your brokenness. He wants your heart. You know, he, he wants your availability to, he wants your honesty above everything else. Honesty with him, honesty with yourself. 
you know, and I had to come to that point. And for the next 11 years, God used that, you know, I'd had a great ministry up to that point, but, the, but the real impact, I couldn't work at the senior level had I not been able to have that confrontation and be honest with myself and honest with God. And, and I, and that, and it just propelled me to be able to work at that senior level and speak with some authority that people would listen. Yeah. Yeah. What a story Larry Cripps has told and lived and, uh, has the experience and the knowledge and the, uh, credentials and everything that goes with it to back it up. Uh, Larry, we've, uh, it's been a privilege collaborating with you uh, to make this book a reality. We're so excited to launch it here in a couple of weeks. Uh, for those of you watching on the podcast or listening, you can go to the hope of war.com and, uh, pre-order it. Well, I don't know if it's coming out in time before it's launched, but you'll be able to order a copy there. It's also available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, everywhere else. Fine books are sold. Uh, so with that, Larry, thanks so much. The book is the hope Thank of you, war. Larry Cripps has been chatting with us. My name is Paul Edwards. This is my co-host Jason Todd, and we will see you next time on the Emissary Authors Podcast. Thank you.